Even the great C.S. Lewis was powerfully captivated by the mysterious legends of Hollow Earth. There is one peculiar passage from the Silver Chair of the Chronicles of Narnia where Lewis provides us with a small glimpse into Bism, a secret world which lies deep within the earth. Are there other lands still lower down? asked Eustace. Oh yes, your honor, said Golg. Lovely places, what we call the land of Bism. This country where we are now, the witch's country, is what we call the shallow lands. It's a good deal too near the surface to suit us. Ah, you might almost as well be living outside, on the surface itself. Down there, said Golg, I could show you real gold, real silver, real diamonds. Bosh, said Jill rudely, as if we didn't know that we're below the deepest mines even here. Yes, said Golg, I've heard of those little scratches in the crust that you top dwellers call mines. But that's where you get dead gold, dead silver, dead gems. Down in Bism, we have alive and growing. There I'll pick up bunches of rubies that you can eat and squeeze you a cup of diamond juice. You won't care much about fingering the cold, dead treasures of your shallow mines after you have tasted the live ones of Bism. My father went to the world's end, said Rillian thoughtfully. It must be a marvelous thing if his son went to the bottom of the world. Here we are, C.S. Lewis, absolutely. I mean, some would say that this is fantastical in fiction, but we know that he's writing really just history. It's just nonfiction. It's yeah, nonfiction. It's nonfiction. It's it's bism is real. Yeah, it's bism is real. C.S. Lewis is giving us an eyewitness account. We can only assume. He's just choosing to use characters. <laughs> only, right. Yeah, that's a safe assumption to be made. Uh, the point is this, C.S. Lewis, Hollow Earth, fan. Look, at, least, at least a fan. Yes. And that's what we want to start with. So I, I'm just going to lay out a bit of an outline for this episode Hollow Earth theory, its main components, um, its theory, its history, some of the guys who are involved. After that, we want to talk about a spiritual reality that we think has physical components as well, uh, which would be a hollow earth applied to the biblical narrative of Sheol, the realm of the dead, not hell. We'll draw some distinctions, but Sheol, the realm of the dead with different uh, places, a place of paradise, Abraham's bosom, those kinds of things. So we'll move from hollow earth to Sheol, then from Sheol and hollow earth, getting the concept of primary water theory that a lot of people are probably unfamiliar with, but is all but fact at this point. Um, it it is, uh, um, has a major growing consensus of notable scientists, um, and it gets into even the character of God. Is God capricious? Is he uh, sinister? Did he command us to be fruitful and multiply, knowing that obedience to that command would bring about um, our own demise, uh, that we would have you know, the, the overpopulation myth? No, the, it's not a zero-sum game. The pie can grow, uh, that water is not a finite, uh, a recycled resource, but a renewable and infinite. It's constantly being produced, so primary water theory. And then in terms of applications, applying that to the beautification of the earth, eradicating deserts, getting rid of the Sahara, making it a garden, uh, a city, a paradise, talking about not just the location. We're going to talk about the location of the lost city of Atlantis, uh, but not mm. just the, the location, but the very real possible uh, restoration of of Atlantis, bringing it without back the to Nephilim. its, without the Nephilim, bringing it back to its redeemed greater glory in human history, not just when Jesus returns, but progressively leading up to it. So restoration of earth, uh, the, the, the discovery and restoration of Atlantis, and then applying primary water theory and hollow earth theory to other places like Mars with polar ice caps, proof of water, underground oceans that scientists are already uh, speculating about. Could Mars become a, a, a a, 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 a hospi hospitable habitable. place, habitable place, hosp uh, hosp hospitable place to human life, vegetation, <laughs> these kinds of things. Um, and then lastly, uh, primary water theory, hollow earth, uh, shield, these components as it pertains to elongated human lifespans, right? Not just that um, that are, that are we're the lesser sons of former sires that lived for 900 years, but that uh, Isaiah 65 could actually be fulfilled in human history before the final physical return of Christ. Isaiah 65 that says the youth shall die at 100. Right now, you know, uh, lifespans have already been increased to the point if somebody dies at 45 and it was a few hundred years ago, we'd say they, they lived a full life. If somebody dies at 45 today, we say he was just a kid. Uh, but, but Isaiah 65 says that the youth shall die at 100, um, presupposing or at least implying that you could have 400, 500, maybe even back to 900 year lifespans. What if 
Christ is so potent in his victory that he comes to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found and that and that uh, that we actually hit a thousand year, an even greater lifespan to say that, uh, that the second Adam and his victory um, uh, dwarfs the first Adam and his, and his sin and failure. So we're gonna be talking about uh, hollow earth theory, Sheol, primary water, Atlantis, Mars being cultivated and the lost fountain of youth. Here we go. No small task. How much time? No small task. Time do we have, Joel? <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna give it our very best. Um, it may end up being a two parter. We'll see. But uh, but let's start with uh, the first thing on the list. What is hollow earth theory? Who are some of the components? Why does it matter? So the the first main character to promote this idea of hollow earth, with which basically just says that the outer surface that we live on, in the most extreme case, is a shell, mm -hmm. and inside of that shell there are subsequent. Uh, concentric spheres or other shells that kind of revolve around each other. And one of them might be very hot and very bright. Some of them might be filled with oceans and there may even be living creatures or, or plants. Vegetation. Entire lands, entire other worlds within our own. That's the, the most extreme, the version that we're all familiar with from sci-fi works like Journey to the Center of the Earth. Mm -hmm. but the King first, Kong, Godzilla. Yeah, yeah, King Kong, Godzilla. But, but the first man to promote this idea seriously was Edmund Hillary. No, Edmund Hillary, actually, no. Haley. If it, if it was Edmund Hillary, <laughs> we could only hope that there that person went to jail. <laughs> is, is, is Haley's first name Edmund? Yeah, Edmund Haley. Okay, you, you, so the you first, got half of it. Yeah. yeah. So, so the first man to really promote this idea is Edmund Haley, and he's the guy of Haley's Comets fame. And so he is a legitimate scientist, yeah. friend of Isaac Newton. He's a yeah. royal scientist. Yeah. He actually studied under the first James Flamstead. Royal scientist, mm. which is very exciting. So he's a he's a credentialed guy, right? And he noticed the polar shifts in the Earth, uh, in the in the Earth's magnetic magnetic he, field. He, he's trying to solve some problems from observing magnetic issues. Yeah, how the Earth's magnetic field was generated, and he's how trying to reconcile issues in the physical model of his day. Yeah. The Empirical fact that issues. over time, North on your compass begins to shift and change, and so he's yeah. trying to account for that. Yeah, and instead of ma you know magma uh, underneath the core and being this fluid thing, well, it's because it's all you know fluid in this movie. He's saying, but what if there's actually concentric spheres and there's a magnetic sphere that's more iron and more this and more that that's moving at a different speed than the outer surface, or even a slightly different direction and that that's what's changing the you know causing these changes to the compass and what's accounting for north and those kinds of things it's a, he was a serious scientist yeah, very serious guy and he was positing this idea that, that well this could help explain right and was haley even promoting the idea of civilizations or anything at no. all under yeah. the earth he was simply positing a physical model for the makeup of the earth yes. itself some of these later jules verne type you know possibly mythologies possibly True. Maybe their Real history. Maybe they happened. Right. Maybe Haley they was happened. much more just a geological model. He was just trying right. to figure out how does the earth work, right? right. What's, the, what's the model? And yeah. then Haley, the guy who takes the baton from him would be... John Symes. Yep. Who is an army ranger he, or, or an army officer. He's not actually a scientist. Mm. Uh, but he gives a series of lectures and writings in the early 1800s that promote this idea that Haley first came up with but then he takes it a step further mm -hmm. and he starts to say, well, there could be entire ecosystems, entire civilizations yeah. that are under our feet and we have to go find them. Yeah. And, and it's this whole other land full of riches and life and wealth and or dragons and yeah. fire and a whole nother right. sun and ocean. Yeah. All Cla of these fantastic things. Classic 19th century explorer type of yeah. and he actually, spirit. He tried to get government approval and funding to take an expedition to the North Pole. Which worked, we, not for him, but for right, the next guy. Not Go for ahead. him. But, and, and so everyone said no, but the problem was his ideas were so popular mm. that it could no longer be ignored. The public ran with it. Right. And they loved science. That's a better ideas. story. Right. Yeah, it is it's a, better it's a story. way better story. And then that <laughs> gives be birth. Honest. So that gives birth to another naval officer, uh, Reynolds, I believe, is is one of the next guys who actually does um, an expedition, an Arctic expedition, and is trying to map out, you know, the, the Arctic and see if um, he he begins to conceptualize uh, that there actually might be openings at the two poles, the poles, polar openings to these lower levels of worlds beneath worlds bism. within this, ex to bism, exactly. To bism. So Let's he's now trying to, to go and chart these things out. And then the last guy, most recent, 1910 to 1977. So this guy, you know, has only been dead for less than 50 years. And that's Richard E. Byrd. Um, uh, and, and then Byrd uh, claims 
that on one of his expeditions mm -hmm. that he actually found one of the entrances to hollow earth yeah. um, in an, uh, uh, the southern, uh, s southern Arctic, I think. Yeah, uh, it was the Antarctic South Pole area. And he writes in his diary how he, he goes in. He went in. And found and giants. Found giants. Civilizations. And, uh, advanced technology. Advanced technology. And, yeah. And all yeah. that's in his diary that his son published after his death. And that leaves us, you know, about up to date in terms yes. of, so yeah. that's the, some of the main key players, um, the way that the theory has progressed. In the um, modern, in the modern age. Right. In yeah. the modern age. Yes. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we'll go back to the ancients right. and talk about mm -hmm. some of that and different conceptions, but that's just the modern age, uh, beginning with Haley from a very uh, uh, strict, you know, uh, scientific approach. This was not a uh, fiction author. This is, you know, this is, he's saying, no, I think this is real. Um, and the only thing that, that begins to develop further from Haley is the idea that these concentric spheres, that there may be space between them. Mm -hmm. And that's where, of course, you have theories such as, you know, as Ben's shock theory, a commonly known theory. You can find it on <laughs> Wikipedia. That's right. Um, you know, we, ha we have a whole episode on that, a bonus episode. So I'll plug that real quick. If you want to find out more about the history, the key players in the theory of hollow earth and how it works from a scientific perspective, uh, join us on Patreon. You can become a Patreon uh, member and we're, we're going to have a few bonus episodes and that's one of them. Um, and But the shock theory, quick synopsis with that is just saying, just like bones are porous, yeah. right? So saying, uh, okay, so we're not saying that you have uh, these layers, concentric spheres and that they're not touching. We're, we're saying, no, there are pillars and columns and all these different things porous, like the inside of a bone uh, and that that actually would be advantageous uh, to make the, the earth more durable, flexible, right. give with certain seismic shifts, earthquakes, uh, strikes from a meteor, or these kinds of or things. Or even gravitational anomalies. It, right. it, it gives the earth mechanical advantage to have some sort of internal damper exactly. that, that helps resist uh, gross spring-like mechanical stress that would that, that it would experience from other heavenly bodies. But what this allows for is not just spheres within spheres, but space in between mm -hmm. uh, that could uh, could f feasibly, conceptually, it could accommodate its own uh, heat source, light source, water, uh, vegetation, life, creatures, atmosphere, a world within worlds. Absolutely possible. And anybody who says it's not um, is a liar. So we're not saying that this is true, uh, but what we want to help you out throughout the, the course of the series is uh, not us making definitive um, uh, claims, this is true. Um, but what we will say definitively is that those who attempt to definitively say this is not true, um, they, they don't have a leg to stand on. And part of the reason is because they, they can't get down there. Yeah. Because we've never even made it through the Earth's crust, not even not close. even close. Let alone into the mantle, which is which uh, supposedly makes up the bulk of the inside. right. And to put it into perspective, we're talking about approximately eight thousand miles yeah. from from top to bottom of the Earth. Uh, the crust being just like I mean, think of an M and M with a you know a very thin candy you know hard shell layer. That's the crust. Uh, there's so the crust is a very in terms of depth, it is you know um, comparatively very small with the rest of of the inside of the Earth. Uh, but still, the crust is a few hundred miles. Right. I think I think it's a little over a yeah. hundred. And and you have and we haven't even gotten close thirty nine hundred to, to go to the well, center of the earth. And the right. reality is, if you were to shrink the earth down to the size of a baseball and hold it in your hand, and you took all the water off, the distance between the deepest trench and the highest ocean to you would be almost imperceptible. Actually, I, I have heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say that at scale, the earth without any water is smoother than the cue ball uh, at a pool table. It's that. Mm. It's smoother than a pool ball. We, we're so small that with we look Everest, at these things and we with, say they're huge. With Everest, with the Mariana Mar Trench. Mar you actually Trench, wouldn't yeah. even feel it on your finger. Wow. It's if just you, so... If, yeah, if it was the size of a pool Tiny, ball. tiny to us. And we're talking Everest going up 26,000 feet, I think, in change. 28,000. Yeah, when we go down to the crust now, that's a couple, that's like five miles. We're looking at a couple hundred miles and even right. that. And even that is, is, just is nothing. The shell. Golg, when he says that, oh, those things you call mines, just scratches. those are just scratches, scratches on, on the it. surface. Right. Lewis actually got that right. He got I mean, that that's, right. That's that's it, that is correct. Point because you're talking correct. about a hundred miles in Lewis comparison stuff. with eight thousand. So yeah. so just yeah. going to the center there well, with a knock all the way through. Yeah, yeah exactly. Would yeah. be you know, three thousand nine hundred. Yeah. yeah. Which so, is still negligible. But just giving <laughs> giving guys the scale. All right, so real quick. So now let's talk about the spiritual application and ancients going. So now we're going way beyond Haley, uh, going back in time and talking about how this this goes with, you know, the conception of Sheol, the realm of the dead, and, and not just 
um, ancients who would prescribe to uh, to the, the scripture, uh, but also you know Greek mythology and all, all these different ideas. Um, you know Hades and Hercules going to rescue you know his his love and th- those kinds of things that there uh, very likely is a, a reality to speak of there. Um, but as we do that, I, I think it's also worth you know I, I feel like I've promised it or at least in my head I promised it. Um, but in terms of creatures. Like w- w- I, I think that it, it's at least plausible that you could. We're not just talking about single-celled organisms, you know, or certain, um, uh, certain, w- whatever, you know, uh, um, like amoebas, amoebas or, or yeah, exactly, else. yeah, like or bacteria. Um, it, I mean, this could explain like dinosaurs. Well, there's dragons, been, sea serpents. There's been some pictures that have come out recently that are blurry creatures, of course, of course, because. Uh, you know, creatures that don't want to have their picture taken are always blurry. But off the coast of Antarctica, of these things crawling around the surface that are just bizarre. Mm. And you have stories of scientists that go to Antarctica. H.P. Lovecraft riffed on this in his uh, Mountains of Madness, at the Mountains of Madness, that these scientists claim that they see things that just should not be there, that are completely bizarre. Mm. And there's creatures that are massive and they look like monsters and they're, and they're really... St- weird and they don't know where they go they seem to disappear hmm. uh behind the pyramids of antarctica of course i mean there obviously. are pyramids in antarctica you had the Under nazis the that that were heavily invested yeah in, in trying to conquer right. antarctica and they were also yeah. occultists every yeah. single one of them and they were trying to do nazi bell experiments and, and all these type of right. things to open up things we mm-hmm. don't really know the the details in antarctica because mm-hmm. they were so sure that there's something there that we don't know about yet. That would it, be that would be valuable. And Ameri- we've forgotten and, about. And America yeah. was trying to do it too. They weren't yep. the only. Yep. I mean, they, right. they they probably invested more. But think about that. The whole world is against you, right? With Germany, and you're you're you know, it's going to take everything you got to try to win this war. And you're thinking um, it's worth reserving some of your resources, your wealth, your time, your energy, your manpower to go and try to find this secret that could give you an advantage. And it's not just the ge- geographical <laughs> locale of uh, an uh, advantageous place to be able to go and invade another. It's not just viewing Antarctica like that. It's uh, They actually thought there might be something there. Mm-hmm. Something, something that could help them win the war. Right. So they dedicated not just some of their manpower, but actually some of their brightest minds right. well, to yeah. figuring this place out. And it, it certainly captivated the mind of humanity in our mythology and the stories we tell from ancient times all the way up through, I mean, I think of True Silver and Moria mm-hmm. and the dwarves delving too deep and too greedily and what things were awakened in right. the deep places of the earth. The Balrog. With the Balrog or with uh, in Paralandra when Ransom yeah, goes Ra- into Ra- the planet, into Venus. It's amazing. Ransom mm-hmm. descends into Venus and he sees a, a society of mm-hmm. beings and, there are, and there's like this procession of ornate uh, parades going on underneath Venus and and he actually is worried at one point because he thinks they're not going to know that they have a king and queen on the surface. They're not going to know that they actually don't run this world. Yeah. And then he's calmed quickly by by remembering maybe they're just here because Maladil, God, yeah. delights in them. He wants mm-hmm. to see them here and he's the real king. And so Lewis all through his fiction, all of it, yeah. including Till We Have Faces, which is just a retelling of a Greek myth that I'm sure we'll talk about with mm-hmm. with Persephone and Cupid mm-hmm. and Psyche, and how uh, you have to actually descend into this world, and there's a whole nother world within, just because God likes it, right? And it would be a glory for man to yeah. discover more of it, mm-hmm. and he actually, in doing so, will discover more about himself. Well, real quick, before we continue with the show, you need to be aware that you're merely watching one episode of what's actually a ten-part series covering all things under the banner of. High Strangeness. The 10 episodes include the following. Number one, the lost city of Atlantis has just recently been discovered. Episode number two, Hollow Earth, the last living dragons and primary water. Episode number three, biblical giants, their clans, sizes, and supernatural abilities. Episode number four, mythological giants. Hercules was actually a Nephilim. Episode number five, Everyone has been wrong about Bigfoot. Episode number six, fairies, the elemental spirits. Episode number seven, the biblical case for the existence of mermaids. Episode number eight, ghost. That's not your grandma. That's a demon. Episode number nine, 
witches, necromancy, and familiar spirits. And lastly, episode 10, angels, their classifications, physicality, and sexes. Now, all 10 of these episodes are available ad-free right now exclusively on Patreon. These episodes are only dropping one at a time over a series of multiple weeks, but you can get them all available today ad-free plus the addition of two exclusive bonus episodes at patreon.com forward slash right response ministries. Again, it's exclusively found at patreon.com forward slash right response ministries go and check them out today and now back to our program too often modern science scientism and scientific rationalism and the way that we think about the world is we ask the question of what and how pretty pervasively and that's good that's that's a proverbs 25 2 it's the glory of god to conceal a thing it's the glory of kings to search the thing out we have this instinct deep within us that even those who deny god's very being can't escape the instinct to ask why and how, or, or uh, the what and how. But what they fail to ask is often why, because they don't believe there is a why. Right. They don't believe that anything is for anything at all. It just right. is. But what Lewis understood as a medieval, what Lewis understood is that everything is for something. And so we shouldn't just be asking of nature, what is it and how does it work? We should also be asking what would please God? Mm-hmm. What would be glorious? How does what it would blow play your mind to the to the, right. the symphony of creation? Yeah, what would be just over the top in terms of beauty and glory and intricacy? And the, we're so used to some of these things that we actually already know about that we don't realize that they are all absolutely mind blowingly incredible. We talk about um, Ben and I are writing a book right now for Haunted Cosmos, and one of the things we explore quite a bit in the book is is just this idea of okay, the world is not just stuff, but the world also is stuff. And the stuff is pretty magnificent. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about something like, I don't know, a grasshopper that has this insane mechanical mechanism in its leg that it can leap the equivalent of you standing still and jumping a football field. (laughs) It can do that. And it has its uh, it has its nose in its stomach, and it can't you know it's tone deaf apparently. We've learned all these things about this little tiny grasshopper that most of us walk over or crunch under feet and don't think we don't think that much. And I just think, what if you were the inventor of the grasshopper? Mm. Like, would you bring that up at parties? <laughs> You'd want people to notice, like the grasshopper, right? And that's just a tiny little thing. Imagine now worlds yeah, and planets worlds. and the workings of the the spheres of the heavens and the medieval mind, they asked the why, and we need to recover. That's why Lewis is so great. That's why but, Tolkien is so great. But they also asked the why from a fundamental understanding of the world that it's not efficiency and pragmatism. Right. It's actually, uh, it's it's rich. It's, it's beauty deep. and glory. It's like the, the backdrop of this set. It's, it's not just... Uh, some drywall and some paint. Yeah, it, you got you got trim. You got wainscoting. You got paintings. You have books. That's how the world. I think actually we can is. agree that minimalism is gay. Minimalism yep. is fake. I think, I think we just yep. agree. And, right. and, <laughs> in in Christendom, it will be condemned. Yep. In, 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 as a capital. When we when we get our Protestant <laughs> when we get our Protestant Franco, no more no more brutalism. Yeah. Like right. it's it's God didn't make a brutalist grasshopper. No. No. <laughs> like, yeah. So the the modern materialists is arrogant and often, you know, with a subject like this would ask the question, who cares? Yeah, who cares about this? Uh, and we want to ask and an urge and encourage and challenge Christians to ask, uh, why not? Yeah. Right? Instead of who cares, why not? Why not? Until you prove otherwise, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to hold to, not definitively claim that this, is, uh, that this is empirical because I don't have the evidence to support that. But in terms of what's possible, I'm going within the depths of my uh, God-given imagination, um, I'm going to assume the most glorious scenario because that gels better with my understanding from the biblical text of the character and nature of God than anything that's bland. Mm. God is not boring. And so unless you can tell me that there's not a world beneath this world where dinosaurs and dragons and sea serpents and unicorns still exist, then uh, I'm going to say it's possible. Yeah. In fact, knowing what I know about the character of God, I'm going to say that it might even be plausible. 
And so. knowing what we know about the historical record, where it's not just in the Bible that we hear about Sheol, it's all over it's history. Every, every culture had an underworld, and every culture started from one family, from Noah after the flood. Mm -hmm. And so it would make sense that we have rhyming and harmony and slight twisting and corruption from Garbling. the true yeah. from the true story right. of Christianity. The true myth. But that doesn't mean that all of them are nonsense. Right. That actually means that all of them are based on something real. Right. And and you don't just lose the element of real. All of them are embellishments or or mis, uh, uh, or or corruptions. They're lies made up something of partial there. truths. Right. So let's mm -hmm. go there now. So that let's talk about. Um, so that's hollow earth, and that's creatures plausible creatures within a world, under the world. Uh, now let's talk about Sheol, right? And, and as we talk about Sheol, let's talk about the spiritual component. Uh, but the big thing that we want to get at uh, with Sheol is that uh, the very real possibility that Sheol is not just, a, uh, has a spiritual component, uh, but it's quite literal, mm. actually, actually within the earth. That there actually is a place called Sheol, mm -hmm. chasms, uh, physical, literal chasms under the earth. Well, and that this was the dominant view. Yes. For a very long time, until all of a sudden, you know, the smartest generation was born. Um, so you can you can say that we're the yeah. first people who weren't um, uh, stupid to ever live. Well, that's just true, which Joel. is a very arrogant yeah. position to take. Or <laughs> you can kidding. say these guys um, are. It's it's worth exploring their ideas. Yeah. Um, and for them, it was not the world's not just stuff. So certainly they're going to say it has a spiritual component. Mm -hmm. um, but they also weren't Gnostics. Yeah, See, that's right. the thing. We don't want to be materials. We also don't want to be Gnostics. So they would say, it's not just stuff. There's a spiritual component. It's not just spirit. There's a literal component. Mm -hmm. Hell beneath, shield in this case, shield beneath, heavens above, mm -hmm. and a literal sense of the heavens being out there somewhere um, and hell actually being beneath our feet. So shield, Ben, Brian, can we talk about that? Well, even if you just take, for, I mean, it's probably defined our terms a little bit. Sheol yep. is a, a word in the Old Testament in Hebrew that's used as literally to speak about the grave, but also as the abode of the dead. Right. Like you might think of it as an underworld in other uh, mythological accounts of similar ideas. And it has many different components in scripture. You can read in, it appears in Jonah is talking about going to Sheol in Psalm 86, uh, there, there's many passages in the Old Testament that where Sheol is given multiple dimensions to its, like multiple features to its reality. Uh, at minimum, it's certainly the grave in the sense that human beings go into the earth when we die. Right. So at the minimum, we go into the earth, we're buried. Um, the, the, the curse of the serpent is to eat the grave. It's to eat dirt. It's to mm -hmm. eat the dust because his abode will ultimately be Sheol. It will be the grave. He will be the one who's cast into the lake of fire. Uh, there's an element of suffering and of, uh, in, in some conceptions like fire and mm -hmm. heat and darkness. And it's a place where, um, you know, it, essentially where people are, are in the Psalms, for example, pleading with God to rescue. Rest, don't leave my soul to Sheol. Um, Abandon me. In Psalm uh, 16, 16. In Psalm 16, I said it's music. I should remember it. Yeah, you should remember The The metrical wow. 1650 um, translates it to, my soul thou will not leave in hell, nor suffer wilt thou to leave thy holy one in sepulcher or corruption, leave, you know, leave there too, something like that. And it's a, clearly a messianic Psalm in that later they say, well, David saw corruption who wrote right. that, but G Jesus did not. We see in the biblical record that Jesus goes into Sheol, which we preserve in our creeds, that Jesus descended into He descended. Hell, yeah. And, and he led captivity captive. So that his body was buried in the sepulcher. And then yeah. in a sense, that's Sheol, but that his spirit actually mm -hmm. descended beyond that. Yeah. And we're saying that it's absolutely plausible that his spirit descended in a literal sense to the belly of the earth beyond yes. much deeper than the grave. And that in that place that there were literal chasms yeah. mm -hmm. divided into certain parts. And one, a place of mm -hmm. paradise, Abraham's bosom, yeah. uh, that were not yet in heaven uh, mm -hmm. with God because the way had not yet been attained. But now, so now Christ is leading a host of captives. Yes. So they weren't tormented there. They were in a place of paradise, separated by a chasm mm -hmm. between those who were in torment. Uncrossable. Uh, but exactly. Um, but then Jesus now, uh, we would say that Old Testament saints yeah. have been transferred now in heaven and those who have died since the cross, yeah. uh, that they're now in heaven as well. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. But before that, 
Um, the idea is not just a spiritual component, but in a literal component that Jesus in the spirit, so body in the grave for three days, in the spirit descended and proclaimed his victory, not giving a, a second chance or offer of mm-hmm. redemption, uh, but a, 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 a Christ-like nanny, nanny, boo-boo um, announcement. I told you uh, so. I told yeah. you so. Um, shaming <laughs> yes. uh, these 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 spirits, putting them to open shame, mm-hmm. um, and and, uh, and then and then leading a host of captives, yeah, the, the saints, heavens. the righteous. Um, but that that's actually not just a spiritual concept, but that, that it actually might be a place yeah, like, beneath our feet. And we get that from in the writings of Samuel. We hear about Saul <laughs> going to visit the witch of Endor. Yeah, when he see and, and, he, and he's asking the witch to divine for him the sp- the ghost of Samuel. And she's surprised when she realizes that, oh, oops, it it's worked. actually the ghost of Samuel. It was supposed <laughs> yeah. to be my familiar spirit, and it's not. Right. The D, don't do DMT, kids. Mm-hmm. Don't and, do DMT. And so, and so Samuel rises up. Out of the earth. Out of the earth. Yeah. And that matters because he's dead. Right. And where, so he's- Where was he? He was, was down he? there. He was in the earth. Down and the here's earth. the thing. A lot of, well, he's, he's a spirit. It doesn't matter. No, <coughs> he's a spirit. Just because you're a spirit does not make you omnipresent. No one is omnipresent apart from God. Right. So spirits right. are geographically bound. They're somewhere. Yeah. They're they are somewhere. Physical they are in a place. Mm-hmm. And so Samuel rises from the earth. You couple that with the parable in, in Matthew's gospel. You're talking about the parable of Lazarus, Lazarus and the rich right, man. And, the rich man. Mm-hmm. Yep. and you hear how the rich man is separated from Lazarus by a chasm mm-hmm. that he can't cross. And yet Lazarus and Abraham can see him and hear him. And, the, and he can do the same. He can see them and hear them. And that is Abraham's bosom. And so now that Christ has ascended to the right hand of God, now that the work of salvation has been accomplished, he led Abraham's bosom, this paradise neighborhood of Sheol is what I've called it. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a neighborhood of Sheol that's parad, you know, paradisal. Yeah. Uh, and, and he has led that now to where Paul is right in saying that when he dies, he, his spirit is in the presence of the Lord. Be with right. the Lord. Right. And Who he, is seated at the right hand of the Father? So obviously Christ is not still in Sheol. Right. And when, <laughs> right. when we think about the way that the scriptures speak about these things, we, we tend to insert hidden premises of spiritual allegory and metaphor um, in sometimes ways that are uninterrogated, where the scriptures speak about the third heavens. Right. And the third heaven. And the scriptures speak about the belly of the earth. And then we just sort of translate that immediately in our modern conceptions of the spiritual and the physical. We tend to conceive of them not being nested together, but being totally kind of hermetically sealed, separated realms Mm -hmm. in a way where it's like, oh, you're in heaven. Where is heaven? Well, it's nowhere. It's spirit, so it's nowhere. It's strictly on a 17th dimension, (laughs) ethereal plane outside of the universe instead of, but what if it's in the universe? And and yet Christ ascends, as we were talking about last night in the hotel lobby, Christ ascends in his bodily form until he's hidden by a cloud. Yes. Right. And and that's not a metaphor. Right. He's, he goes up into the clouds and and Paul says he goes to the, he gets a vision of the third heaven or whether he's caught up there bodily, he doesn't know. Even he doesn't know, but it's a, this is when he's caught up. His spirit is caught up or his body's caught up. But in the case of Jesus, this is why it's significant. So Jesus now uh, has his glorified body and he appears to the disciples and and appears to over 500 uh, eyewitnesses and has multiple appearances. And in these appearances, uh, we we can tell that Jesus in his glorified body, so same body that was Mm. buried, but now made new. So not a new body, meaning another body body, but same body, but glorified, mm-hmm. uh, made new. And that's a resurrection. Like in the case of other people who were resurrected, the more technical and accurate word would be a re- revivification, revivification. Yeah. right? So like Lazarus um, is not glorified when, the, when it's he's, still a seed. he's revived, but, but you know, it's kind of sucks for to be Lazarus, but he just ends up having he to die twice, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. but, but Jesus is raised as a first fruits. Mm-hmm. So otherwise, if it's not different, uh, the resurrection and revivification being distinct, then you Jesus wouldn't be the first fruits. Lazarus and other, mm-hmm. even before that, you know, Elijah raising, you know, this woman's son. For the, there would be other guys who would be first fruits because there were other resurrections. But rightly viewed, uh, they're not being glorified. It's right. revivications mm-hmm. coming back from the dead, but with the same body. Uh, Jesus is coming back with the same body, but now in a glorified state. And in that glorified state, in his appearances with the apostles, um, he can appear. Uh, with doors being locked. And he can vanish. Um, and, and vanish. Now, there's also the physical, literal component. He can eat fish, and you could touch the wounds yeah. in his side or in his hands. Um, he can be seen. He could be touched. He can uh, digest. He can eat. Um, but he also can uh, 
whether it's walking through the door or just vanishing out of, you know, uh, or appearing out of thin air and then vanishing. Uh, but here's the point as it goes back to the ascension. Um, in our creeds, and in more importantly, scripture that the creeds are based upon, uh, why, why don't we have the incarnation, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the vanishing of Christ? We, that last part, no. if you're listening yeah. uh, closely, dear listener, that last part, was a, that, that was a trick. We don't have the vanishing of Christ. We have the ascension. Right. And in the ascension, think about that. He, he physically lifts from the grave, because he could just vanish. He's yeah. already proven that he could do that. Just vanish and go to the 17th dimension, right? Because you can't, uh, ascending would, would be of no avail. That doesn't help you because it's, it's not a place that's above or below. It's, it's on another plane. It's strictly spiritual. But that's not what happens. He physically lifts up off the ground, ascends, and only becomes uh, no longer are visible um, because he, he just lifts for a while and then vanishes. He goes not, in a not, cloud. No, he gets behind a cloud and visibility is obstructed. Um, it's perfectly plausible to assume that he continues to ascend. Right. Going somewhere. Someplace. Someplace. And he's seated now. He's forever the God man, right? So Jesus is in the flesh forevermore and his flesh is seated on a throne. Flesh physical flesh, seated on a physical throne at God's right hand. We don't know exactly where. Uh, certainly a, a place with, where the spiritual component, I think, is heightened from our earthly existence and, and, and heightened to a degree and in certain measures and ways that we can't comprehend at this point. But to say that it's only spiritual, that there's no physical component to angels yeah. or to heaven. Now, God himself, the Father and the Spirit are most pure spirits without body parts and passions. Mm -hmm. The Son is both uh, the divine nature and the human nature. Mm -hmm. But to say that heaven, not speaking of God, uh, but but heaven and angelic beings, that there's no physical element whatsoever is a, a, such a leap and an assumption beyond the biblical narrative uh, that, that I think it reeks of arrogance. It's, it's, it's us translating again, that hermetic seal between the physical and the spiritual, instead of seeing them as nested together. Right. And that that's actually a good thing, that God wanted it to be that way. It's it's why, you know, when you look at, I come back to the medievals a lot and Lewis's understanding of the medievals. I think because of his understanding of the medieval mind, that was not, it didn't have, it had errors, but not the same ones that we have. So it's very valuable to read them mm -hmm. because when you when you look at the way they saw the world, you discover that you know when when they looked at um, when they looked at uh, the the idea of even let's say heaven and Lewis in the Great Divorce does this well and it's then translated into the Last Battle in Narnia, where uh, of course love not the things of this world for the things of this world are passing away. Don't don't marry yourself to the fall to this fallen creation. It is passing away, and yet I think Lewis conceptualized this well when he saw it as the door to the old Narnia closing, and but then everything true and good and beautiful, the real true Narnia. Right. It's not a floaty seventeenth dimensional spiritual place. That it's a it's Physical. a new heavens and new earth. It's, it's they're, real. They're going up, go come further up and further, further in up into up the mountain. Down. In the great divorce, it's as if um, the the world that we that uh, the fallenness and the, the world is passing away. He almost conceives of it as like shrink. It's so tiny. It's almost it's like a dust mote. It's insignificant. And and then you come up into the heaven, and it's like it's true. There's true color, and there's true beauty, and there's like to me. That is a much more rich understanding of the physical and spiritual and the nesting together right. too than the, the only, way we often translate. The only, and that, you know, at one point, one of the characters further up and further in, it's yeah. all in Plato. And the only thing, and I think there, there's there's something in Plato. <laughs> the only thing I would add to that is, um, and it's all in Plato and a good bit is also in um, Aristotle uh, because mm -hmm. the difference with, with what we where, we, where I would disagree with C.S. Lewis in his conception, this is the last battle, the final, the Chronicles of Narnia series, is I would say that... Um, uh, I think Lewis got it right, um, but he only got half of it right. The other half is, but then eventually the old Narnia, Narnia that you're mourning, uh, that one was actually also real. It was not just something that was a signpost pointing to the true form, the reality that existed in, in a true form somewhere else. But the true form was also physical and literal, not just a, a meta metaphor. So the form is real, but also this is real. And that the final thing is that Aslan comes back to this world that's been iced over and eaten bare by dragons and father time, and then makes that one real too. And it even dwarfs in magnificence uh, the other one, you know, and then we come back there. Like that was we're caught up. Right. The world is remade and then the new city descends upon we'll, the We'll earth. have to have a Joel, a Joel Webin, right? Response. 
Charnia. <laughs> Charnia. I mean, well, Charn, <laughs> Charn is not Charn. good. That's you don't too want close Charn. to Charn. You don't, yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to be yeah, that. The white witch, that's not good. Yeah. The word soap makes Christian soap. What makes our soap Christian? First and foremost, it is because our soap is good soap made exclusively from natural and organic ingredients. In addition to making a good product, we also promote a good message. Our bottles of soap aren't wrapped in heretical garbage. They're wrapped in sound doctrine and the infallible truth of scripture. Lastly, we have a good mission. At the word soap, 10% of all our profits go directly to the godly men and women at Abolitionist Rising who are fighting to protect the lives of unborn children. Our product is pure, our message is true, and our mission is pleasing to Christ. So join us. Visit thewordsoap.com today. Again, that's thewordsoap.com. Everyone needs soap, so wash yourself in the word. Are you a beef jerky enthusiast? Well, then stop it. Seriously, stop it. Because... Biltong is superior to beef jerky in every single way. It's a traditional South African meat snack, but it's free from all the preservatives, the sugar, and the soy. It's like the Wagyu of jerky. Now, here's the exciting news from Farmer Bill's provisions. Farmer Bill's is introducing their brand new product line for your enjoyment. We've got right here the traditional beef slab. You've also got, if you want a smaller portion, you've got the slices. It's just as much meat, but you're able to eat it in increments. This is for yourself as an individual or maybe for you and your family, your kids. Then you've got the meat sticks. This is what, if you're a working man, you want a snack to keep in your pocket to eat you know, before lunch or something like that, grab one of their beef sticks and take it on the go. Lastly, you got to check out the tallow. For all the moms out there, my wife, she swears by this. Many women in our church say that it's a fantastic product. So don't waste any more time. Go to farmerbillsprovisions.com today to support a Christian-owned small business. And while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe so that you can save on multiple options and ensure that you and your family will never be without your favorites. Don't wait any longer. Go to farmerbillsprovisions.com right now. Get 20% cash back on your first order by using the link below. So, okay, so that's, all right, so what we've done so far is we've given you an uh, outline. We started with Lewis, right? That's just a good start. Cold Always. open. If you didn't like that, then you know what? Just I'm just, sorry, guys. You know, just get out of here. I, 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 I'm sorry. Just Look, after try, careful consideration, I tried, tried to talk no everyone worse. in to starting with Tolkien in the halls of Mandos, but Joel said no. <laughs> because he hates the Silmarillion. I, I can't well, the Silmarillion, I'm sure it's amazing, but it's just uh, it's just beyond me. I, That's it's also just a lie. I didn't me. actually. I'm more of a Hobbit and Lord of the Rings guy, <laughs> you know, just a normie. I'm just a normie. Um, but okay, so we started with Bism, C.S. Lewis. That got us to Hollow Earth. We gave both the theory uh, in, in a, in a 30,000 foot view and some of the key players. Then we moved from that to Sheol. And mm-hmm. we've talked about that now. Now we want to move back to kind of Hollow Earth but also some conceptions of Sheol, some conceptions of Bism, a little bit of Middle Earth, get it all in there, primary water. That's one mm-hmm. thing that we have. And then and then we'll end with three uh, uh, primary water, just for the record. If, if we were if we were gauging here in terms of, we're saying it's all possible, some plausible, um, but, but if we were gauging percentages, if we were betting men and we were taking bets on hollow earth theory as, as conceptualized by uh, a bird, yeah. Um, you know, I'd say, uh, I, you know, I'll put it at like a 40%. Possible. You know, well, that's I'll put high, it at, high. At, a, at a 40%. I was going to say you know? 2.4%. Okay, 2 point. But we're all, but none of us are giving it a zero. <laughs> no, 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 no. And none of us are giving so it over 50 like, there's a okay, chance. I, right. I'm saying the concept of hollow earth, as in a, a richly cavernous earth with a lot of yes. wide spaces. That one I'm putting it like, yeah, that one I'm putting, like, I, I fully, was going to say I, 90. I genuinely but, yeah. fully believe that that's true. But then the primary water thing. But then that's my point. So I just want the listener to be aware this matters. So like if we're saying um, King Kong level uh, journey to the center of the earth, that's where I'm putting 40. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm still giving it 40. Still, he's still, still giving, giving it 40. 40 crazy. Goodness. And I want the listener to appreciate that. That's all. That's a hopeful. That you have that's ha- Abraham hoping against hope. You have haunted that's- Cosmos on your show, Joel. <laughs> and we are you saying, have just and I'm saying, out wait, hoping you guys. Yeah. Us. yeah. So, so putting that at 40, we got a 2.5 over there. We've got a. Of the full Monty. Give me 10. 
uh, of no. the bird conception. Okay. <laughs> like z- literally zero. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah, th- but wait, thank but, you. but yeah. I'm saying like definitely creatures, definitely yes. ocean. Well, that, yes. That's definitely. what I'm getting. So but then the, the hollow of earth. The deep. Yes. I mean, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So then the hollow earth conception that still could support a uh, heat light, vegetation, creatures, yes. even large creature, large creatures, dragons, sea serpents, but porous, like the bone structure thing. The, the Of course, everybody knows it as the Ben Garrett shock uh, system. Right, yeah. everyone that's, travel, that's, everybody travel that. from one place to another via caverns and yep. underground waterways and things. Absolutely so that one 100%. we're putting 90 to 100%, but yeah, here's I mean, the last one that, that you, I just want you guys to see here that in terms of uh, comparison. Primary water theory, this is not us just like it's so true king, you know, and having fun. You know? <laughs> yeah, no. this, primary water theory, I think, is is uh, if it's not a hundred, it's ninety nine point nine. Well, and the reason is important, and we're gonna and we're gonna spell it out here in just a yes. moment. Because the reason is that, and we're gonna do this in this episode, right? Right. We just right keep now, okay. we're about to do it. The reason this is important that listeners need to understand a lot of this is because when we approach our view of the world through a disenchanted materialist lens, and we tell the materialist story of all things, of, of, of us, the world and all things, then you end up having to start with certain presuppositions. Things like the universe is, you know, it's 14, 17, 19, it gets more billions of years old every day. They got to push it back further. They have to give these vast periods of time, vast amounts of completely cold, dead space that can eventually just by, you know, tooth and nail that can produce life, on earth in these vast geological ages. And there's no benevolent caring God. In no sense is the earth for people. Right. In no sense is any of that true. The Christian story is that though the world and though creation is fallen and cursed, that it was made for man. Right. And it was good. And this primary water issue, I think you're probably going to define it for I'll us here. It out, yeah. It's one of those issues where um, a priori to me, mm-hmm. on the story level, I'm more inclined to to say that sounds more like what God was doing no, this than one, what the other story exactly, is. Exactly. This exactly. This one matters because uh we're not just debating something that would be cool. Yeah. Or right. fascinating. We're debating something that uh the very character of God yeah, in a, exactly. is, at, at some at some level is hinging. Did God create a zero sum game, a fixed pie? And then because remember, it's not just that God created, but but one of the chief commandments, the, the dominion mandate, the cultural mandate is mm-hmm. be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, and Did fill God, the world. according to Bill Gates, uh, God told us to do the very thing uh that that ultimately would be our our suicide, our right. demise, right? And and Bill Gates, you know, uh, like I, I you know, according to Satan, right? Bill Gates, Satan, you know, tomato, I, tomato. I didn't uh, hear uh, like corporate needs you guy. to show the difference between these they're two the pictures. Same, it's the same, the same picture. Yeah, exactly. So Bill, just to be clear, we're not a fan, but it matters with the, the character of God. We're believing, no, the pie can grow, um, that water is a renewable, it's not a finite yeah. resource, um, and that God baked that into the pie. We can garden that the It's going to be renewed. Um, and not just can we have um, uh, more water because it's not finite, that water, just like fossil fuels, right? If you're old earth and, oh, fossil fuels, we only have this many because it takes this many millions of years to produce. If it's 6,000, Years then, that then fossil fuels are being renewed uh, year by year. Um, so, so one, it breaks uh, the overpopulation myth, and it is a myth, and it's a sinister demonic myth right. that, that tries yeah. to get people to doubt the character of God and to disobey one of His clearest commands. It's one that's um, taken root more powerfully in culture than many other myths. Today. Yes. So, so all this matters for the the sake of the character of God. Uh, it's not just fun, although it's very fun, and we'll get there in a moment. But it matters as the character of God. What kind of God is He? Capricious? What kind of God are we talking about? Um, does he does he uh, command his children? Is he like Pharaoh? Is God like Pharaoh? He commands bricks but gives no straw, mm-hmm. or is he a benevolent God? That, and that the world, even under the curse of sin, is still a magical, wonderful, um, generous world yeah. uh, that, that resources us with everything we need for obedience. Ben, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna try to frame how this connects to Hollow Earth. Okay. In a way that has helped me uh, conceptualize of it. So if you take the medieval model too far, then you'll run into this problem where once you go below the surface of the world, there is nothing good. Mm. Their idea was that the curse goes only so far as concerns man. So it stops at the boundary of the moon. The light side of the moon is the last cursed thing that we can see and everything beyond it does not feel the effect of the curse. It's, it's in no need of redemption because it has always only ever been holy and it's heaven. And so as you descend, the reason to them that the earth was the center of the universe is not because they were narcissistic, is because the earth was the heaviest thing because it was weighed down by sin. 
Mm. It was, so it sits at the center like, like a bowling ball on a trampoline that takes away all the fun from everything else. Mm. And so as you go to the center of the earth, you get further and further and further away from holiness and closer to pure corruption. That's why Dante has Satan sitting at the bottom of hell, which is the very center of the earth. The pit. Because that is the worst place that you could ever possibly be. And I think that they were wrong to think that. I think that I love, I, first of all, I love that model. And I think it's just beautiful. But I think that they took it too far when they say that once you descend to the surface, it's only ever bad. There's nothing redeemable. There's nothing good. Descend beneath the surface. Right. Mm -hmm. Once you descend beneath the surface, uh, it won't even be redeemed. It's right. not worth redeeming. We know that that's not true because Sheol used to contain a paradise. Right. We know that, the, that under the world is goodness, that there's still light, that, that it's worthy of redemption as well. And so... That connects to the... That the center of the earth, what you're arguing is both in a metaphorical, spiritual sense, but also a literal sense, that the center of the earth is like exactly like the surface, that there's both good and bad. Right. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not either or. So in, in the center, you have Abraham's bosom, but then you also have tar Tartus. Yeah, and so like, Sheol will eventually be, eventually be thrown into the lake of fire. And right. I don't fully understand how the mechanics of that will work. Mm -hmm. Right. But what I do know is that Christ's lordship will be proclaimed from the river to the ends of the earth. And there's nothing that... that makes me believe that that doesn't include underneath the surface. Right. So th with that in mind and knowing that God's not capricious, there must be things in the earth that can help man right. in obeying God and in realizing Christ's lordship as it, you know, as it concerns him. And yeah. this same theological principle, and we're starting with a theological principle right. and then getting to physical and literal applications, but the same, same theological principle that you're espousing works for what's beneath the earth. It also works from what's above. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the same way that we're, we're going to say certain minerals and certain products and things like that, and then primary water is where we're going to hang our hat. But uh, within the earth, under the earth, that there are things that are necessary and good and benevolent under the earth um, likewise, um, who is to say that there aren't uh, certain meteorites with trillions of dollars, and this has actually been proven, but True. trillions <laughs> of dollars worth of resources in terms of, of minerals and, mm -hmm. and certain metals, precious metals that we don't have on earth that are different densities that, yeah. that you can make different things. Think, think about this. You, you know, you have Stone Age and then, uh, you know, uh, Bronze Age or, I, you know, and then Iron and, and these kinds of things. And with each of these discoveries, you have uh, new worlds, new civilizations. You have, uh, it's like turning a whole chapter in the story of humanity based off of technological discovery that if you boil it down to the simplest form is substance. They discovered a new substance. Like even the Tower of, of Babel, um, you, you have uh, a, a technological innovation, namely the brick, yeah. right? We've, yeah. we've discovered the cutting edge technological advancement, you know, the brick. We can build a tower to the heavens. And I think there was probably a lot more going on than just bricks, but that was part of it. It's more than that, but not less. Um, and, and then later on, you know, stone, stone age, fire, wheel, all this. And then even now you say, well, we're beyond that now. No, we're not. Uh, we're in the silicon age. It's mm -hmm. still a substance. Yeah. And it's a substance that can be divided in a certain way, razor thin with a certain flexible properties, but also durability that allows for um, uh, your, phone, your phone well, your, and, in your pocket. And, and who's to say silicon is the end? It's not. Well, we tend to conceive of be the next else? advance as a better of what we currently have. So people tended to think of the next advance in travel to be a better horse and buggy. Right. They couldn't conceive of a a internal combustion a engine. No right. So we're, we're, we're not just talking about better silicon chip. The next thing, it's, out, it's difficult to conceive of it because uh -huh. we haven't made the necessary technological discovery, the glory that God hid somewhere down right. in the depths or up in a meteor. And uh, the next one, who's to say that it might not take us the right. same leap that computing took us from. Because all we've been doing for several decades at this point, but still less than a hundred years, mm -hmm. but you know, so relatively short span of time. But all we've been doing is just um, just better and better applications of silicon, doubling the computing but power. We're talking about at a turning the. Rate. We've been turning the page, mm -hmm. but yeah. I'm talking about turning the chapter. Yeah, a new a new chapter altogether. This it, 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 can I introduce yeah. the the water issue yes. here? Okay, so the story, the materialist story of the Earth is just this very long horrific kind of formation over a long, long, long period of time as, um, you know, dust and rocks and all this stuff in space coalesces into the earth and then gets hot enough from its density. And, and then, well, where'd all the water come from right. eventually? So that the goo could eventually make people that would then think about how the goo made people really, you know, strange. Uh, <laughs> and, and the idea that they've come up with over, again, needing billions and billions of years is that most of it came from outer space that it came from impacts from 
celestial bodies that brought water with them or materials that in the process of striking the earth, hydrogen and oxygen became the oceans. And that this was a vast amount of time that it took for this to take place. And that therefore, the only water that's, that's uh, on earth is the water that we already have, unless we get more meteors, but this happens very right. slowly. And that all we have is the hydrological cycle right. where water evaporates into the clouds, rains down, goes into aquifers, rivers, goes into the ocean, evaporates out. The thing you learned in elementary school. Right. So water and that's is, it. is the same water finite since fixed. the very beginning. So even from a young earth conception, which we would hold to, all of your water that you're drinking is 6,000 years old and it's recycled. And, and that's all there is. The it's vast finite majority of it. And old recycled And the vast majority of it is salinated and not drinkable. Without desalination, right. and with the that, vast majority, there's no there's no perfect efficiency. We mm -hmm. live in a cursed world, so with every recycling, you're losing some. There's you, degradation you and right. loss. And exactly. So it's finite. We're losing some. That's where you know guys would you know would say water is the most precious and scarce resource, and it's all this fear mongering, Mad Max kind of scenario okay. and overpopulation myth. You know, and this is why we need euthanasia. This is why we need abortion. This is yeah. why you shouldn't have kids. This is Birth why you control. should get a vasectomy when you're 20. This is like I yeah. mean, it's, we're talking about demonic people with oh, demonic yeah. ideas, uh, but they're basing it like one of the is on a scare tactic, right? How, where, where do their yeah. ideas actually find their power, their leverage? to where people would buy into it and do these, you know, actually believe the Bill Gates of the world. Uh, well, that, that by convincing everyone that it's scarce, that it's finite, it, you know, if we have more people, then uh, you won't have water to drink. Yeah. Um, and primary water theory, so, so my point is, there is actually an incentive from mm -hmm. uh, wicked people in high places of power, yeah. the regime, trash world, whatever you want to call them, the Nephilim, right? The DMTers, you know, the communers with devils. Uh, these people uh, actually have a vested interest, right? When you're, when you're judging conspiracies, right? Because um, a lot, number one, we found out in the last three years and, and some of us, you know, already knew, but, but even the normies are waking up and realizing the last three years that a lot of things that were called uh, conspiracies were actually true. Now that said, that doesn't mean that every conspiracy is true. There are such a thing as, as things that are just not true. But when I'm trying right. to gauge, even from a, like a pastoral standpoint, when I'm dealing with someone, they're saying, I, I'm doubting this. I'm suspicious of blank. Uh, one of the first questions I ask is, okay, so who's promoting blank? And would this uh, this person or group of individuals who are promoting blank, um, do they, uh, can we determine, just like solving a crime, a detective, can we determine motive? Would they have a vested interest mm -hmm. if blank was believed by the masses? Would that somehow serve them? Would they be given more power? Would they be given this? Would they be given? And the answer is an emphatic yes. And so all that. So primary water theory, it's the, the uh, it's it's going against um, yeah. the 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 consensus that we've had for a very long time. The hydrological cycle that it's the same water. It's a limited resource, and it's going up into the clouds and coming back down. And and like you said, Ben, that most of it is undrinkable, even with filtration systems and things like that. And even fresh water that is drinkable, um, it may not be saline like water in the Pacific Ocean, uh, but this is something that people don't consider. It's, it's not just uh, chemicals and human corruption through pollution and uh, certain plastics and, and things like that, uh, uh, but, but even uh, water that, that is pure coming from a babbling brook or in, in a, a natural river um, is still 6,000 year old yeah. surface water since the beginning that has been flowing over rocks and minerals and vegetation and all these different things, not just plastics, man-made uh, man components, but even natural things, picking up fluoride and picking up certain minerals and certain components. Some of them, minerals may be good for you, but some of them may be bad for you. And the, for the same reason that when you drink, you, you don't go out in the, in the backyard and grab a, a handful of dirt and put it in your water, right? So uh, 6,000 years of running over mountains, running underground, running over this, running over that, running over oil, running over, you know, all these different things that aren't necessarily advantageous to put in your body. But what if Two big components here. What if water wasn't scarce, but renewable? That uh, deep within the earth, uh, through seismic shifts, pressure, heat, that hydrogen, oxygen, water was actually being made, and rather quickly. And there were whole oceans of fresh water, not salt water, but fresh water oceans beneath the surface. Um, and, and it's not just that there's more water, two big components. There's more water than we know of, and it's new water. More and new. And, and what I mean by that, the new factor is that if we could access it, um, and where it doesn't, we don't have to wait a thousand years for it to make its way to the surface and it's picked up all these different minerals and different components and chemicals and all the other stuff, even if there was no human, um, you know, um, 
pollution. Um, what if we could get water that's only only even been in existence? It was made last year. Mm -hmm. It's 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 new water. Um, it's fresh water. The freshest it's got that water new water you've ever smell. tasted. At, yeah, it's got that it's new, got the new water. Got fresh from real the dealer. new water energy to the <laughs> Yeah, and and what what would that mean? So like so we want to talk about three components: restoration of, mm -hmm. uh, and we want to talk about the lost city of Atlantis. Restoration, beautifying the earth. If we could, if we have whole oceans, underground oceans, freshwater oceans, and it's newer water, and that we could actualize those. Like what what if the church of Jesus Christ, his hands and feet on earth, um, with everything that we do in terms of, of you know preaching the gospel, evangelism, planting churches, but then also um, all of Christ for all of life, not just in church life, but every realm of life in, in economics and in vocation and markets, uh, in education, in medicine. Um, but what if also e even in cultivation and greenery, these that what what if what if it is our destiny by God's grace and through his power um, that we eradicate deserts, that the Sahara Desert is, um, that, that maybe, it's, maybe it takes a, a few hundred years, maybe it takes a few thousand, that, but one day our, our, our descendants, our posterity and children's children uh, would be reading history books about uh, deserts um, because they, they're no more. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they're reading it in a tropical paradise in the Sahara. This used to be a desert, blah, blah, blah. Um, so re-beautifying uh, the world, also the application of what about other worlds? Mars has polar ice caps. And scientists, there's a consensus that there's underwater oceans. What if that can be actualized, brought to the surface with certain drilling equipment? Uh, but then the last thing is a, a fountain of youth, right? So I, I think it's just such a fascinating story of, you know... Ponce, the, Ponce de Leon. That's right, Florida guy, Florida man. Uh, so if you could tell Florida the story, Ben, and then, but then us say that I think he was right, right, but what if it's not a specific locale? What if the fountain of youth is beneath our feet? Now, albeit far beneath our feet, but everywhere. Yeah. And it's just getting to it. And that this water that there's not just more of, but it's newer water, healthier water. What if that's the ticket? Not just medicine that, that comes with a cost benefit analysis. It's like, you, you know, you take this pill, you get better with this symptom, but you develop this other one. Uh, what, if, what if part of the way of getting back to longer lifespans um, that we see not just um, in an antediluvian world before the flood, but even after. Yeah. What if a lot of that has to do with water and that the fountain of youth in a very literal sense is real and, and it's not just in one locale, but it's everywhere and we just got to get there. But story time. Yeah, Juan Ponce de Leon. Yeah. This guy, so Spanish explorer, okay? And he's a Christian man. This is the height of Christendom. They're trying to find new lands that they can spread the gospel in and, and share the greenification of the Lord Jesus Christ, like what you're talking about. But one of Juan Ponce de Leon's primary driving motivations behind his travels was finding the fountain of youth because he believed that it existed. And one has to then ask the question, why did he believe that it existed? And there's there's nothing where he wrote down in a diary, like, this is why I think the, the fountain of youth exists. Mm. But a natural reading of the man and the times that he lived in would be he believed that there was a fountain of youth because he believed what he said he believed, the gospel. He believed that the, that the church was the temple and that the river of Christ was flowing out of the temple to water the entire world. And that as it went, it got thicker and wider and deeper and it, and, and it enriched all the trees that were growing alongside of it. And all the birds went and found nests in there. Maybe he believed Isaiah 65. Maybe he believed that the youth would die at 100. Mm. And he wondered and asked himself, well, how could that possibly be? Because they didn't have advanced medicine back then. They didn't have the nanny state of medicine that we have now. This basically just modern witchcraft, by the way, in an attempt to avoid death at any cost, twisting God's arm and twisting nature into means that are completely contrary to itself right. and to the living God, all in an attempt to avoid death for some and hasten death for others. And still has, has a far <laughs> and it cry. still has failed. Yeah, it, 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 no, no one could say that modern medicine has got us to where we could, with a straight face, say the youth dies right. at 100. Right, and so, and so then you have to ask, okay, well, well it, it maybe if that was the motivation, why Florida? Mm. Why did he seem so keen and bullish on Florida mm. and hopeful? Well, it's because Florida has tons of springs. It's the Lando Lakes, that's your butter, that's where it comes from. It's the Lando Lakes in Florida. And so he goes there and he finds all of these springs and he's able to see like, well, maybe there is hope. You know, I, he never found it. He didn't, he wasn't immortal. He died. That we know of. That we know of. He could still be around, I guess. That we know of. That would, I don't uh, know. Uh, that would actually. In Nate Wilson's books, 
Ponce is still around. Is Not he? a good guy. Really? But there was the turtle that he found that's immortal. Interesting. <laughs> Transmortal turtle. But I mean, this is actually not history. There's this a lot is of Andy religious, Wilson's Ashdown burial. There's a lot there's a lot of religious connotations yeah. in the turtle as well. But and so now, you know, we have to then ask the question, uh, why Florida? And like I'm saying, that he's finding these springs and things like that. But then I think we should also go back and say, is this allowed? Hmm. Should we read Isaiah 65 and think, yes, literally, I want my son, 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 son's daughter, sons to die at 100 and be considered a child. Because we know that if it's literal- or preferably to, to not well, die Well, to not die, but, but if he does, it's like <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. he's a young man. Right. Because if it's literal, we know that that's not the glorified state because people are dying. Exactly. It's, right. Stop there because people need to, a lot of people are not familiar with, so here's the deal. Some of the listeners won't like this. Uh, hear me, I'm saying, I'm saying this humbly. I don't want to turn you off because I want you to listen to this. And if, if your view is that Jesus is going to come back, most people- who, who would uh, profess to be followers of Christ. And many of you listening really are. Um, it's not just a mere profession, but by God's grace, he saved you. You've been born again. You are a Christian and we thank God for you. And right now, the dominant view of end times eschatology for Christians today in the West, uh, because of certain things like dispensationalism and Darby and these things that are relatively new theological ideas in the last 150 years, most people, there's two big beliefs. They think that, um, that Jesus is coming back relatively soon. Um, uh, and a lot of people believe uh, this generation, right? Mm -hmm. We're in the end times. He's coming back next Thursday. So relatively soon. And the second component is they believe um, that God has destined in scripture that things must become progressively worse until he arrives. So things are going to get worse um, and um, he, uh, we don't have much time left. Mm -hmm. He's coming back soon. Um, and I understand that. And if that's your view, uh, we're glad to have you along for the ride. And we don't want to throw shade on that view. We want to be respectful. Um, but there the, are there are other <laughs> eschatological views. And so for yeah. the three of us, for instance, um, and I know that this will sound foreign to some of you, but we would prescribe to what's known as post-millennialism. Um, and so as our eschatological end time view, which uh, doesn't, uh, nobody knows that the day or the hour, no man. Uh, but but in general, we would assert uh, that, that Christ, uh, his return is... Um, is likely still um, off in our our distant future, Long um, way. Uh, and to the point where we would argue that um, that it's possible. Again, not a definitive claim, but it's possible that our future generations would be uh, watching the recording of this show and say, "Oh, these are some of the early church fathers." That that people would read Lewis and Athanasius and Calvin and, and say, "Which one came first again?" Even though they're, they're, you know, at least the in the case like, of uh, uh, Augustine uh, yeah. and Calvin, you know, are, yeah. are separated by a thousand years, you know, you know, eleven hundred. Um, uh, but but they would say, oh, it's eleven hundred years. That's a moot point. So we're talking; it could be ten thousand years. We're not saying it is. No man knows the day or the hour. But Jesus could tell every single generation for the past two thousand years of church history thought that Jesus was going to return in their lifetime, and they've all been wrong. Second component of postmillennialism is one: the return of Christ could be very distant. Two: uh, that things will not get worse and worse, but actually they'll get progressively better, and that they're supposed to because it's a proof of Christ's triumph. That that by the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, uh, that the last thing he said to his disciples before his ascension is all authority on earth, not just 17th dimension authority, but all authority on earth and in heaven has been given to me, and that he commissioned his disciples uh, to disciple the nations, um, to, to uh, preach, to baptize, uh, but also to teach them to obey all of his commands. And we believe that, that God's commandments have application in every realm of human society and life, um, um, and that as we learn to be obedient disciples, as the world is evangelized, and as we are, are obedient to Christ's commands in every realm of life, um, including medicine, including education, including media, including this, including that, and the other, that the world will um, the world will progressively get better. Now, here's the deal: um, think of stocks. The post millennial is not saying that things won't ever get better. Stocks, we're saying, okay, if it's a good stock, the general trend in the long run will be upward. Although there are spikes and dips, and some of those dips can be significant along the way. So, all three of us, just for the record, we're not ostriches with our heads <laughs> in the stand. Um, uh, if you're saying uh, well, things seem pretty bad right now. We're going to say, uh-huh, yeah, we agree. Yeah. We're in, we're in a, a hell of a dip. 
Yeah, um, we're, we're in quite the dip right now. The Chapter, lizard people are ru ruling the world. Like we're we're on board yeah. with Hamas, a lot yeah. of that kind of stuff. Yeah, so we're in a, a big dip. But we're saying uh, that the dip is not all there is until Christ's return. We're saying by His grace, it's and it's not apart from Christ, but through Christ, uh, the church empowered by Christ can get out of the dip, and that this is a dip, and it may be a five hundred year dip. I was, I mean, I would say that we're right now in a three hundred year dip. The Dark Ages, great, wonderful. The Enlightenment, <laughs> trash. Yeah. The Enlightenment is, is the dip, the right? And they've been lying things. to you because the victors get to write the history books. So we've been in, in a dip for a long time, denying God, rebelling against Christ. Um, but we believe that not just will Christ return and get us out of the dip, but Christ through his church as he's ruling in heaven with authority in heaven and on earth will get us out of the dip. And a long time from now, uh, you know, it could be hundreds of years. It could be thousands of years uh, that things can change, that the whole earth could be beautified. And so back to Isaiah 65, the point is Isaiah 65, we don't believe is uh, giving a description of the new heavens and new earth right. after Christ returns. Because here's the sticking point, people still die. <laughs> people are dying. Right, in heaven, people don't die. De because the last, and here's, here's the other dispensational problem, death is not the first of Jesus' enemies to conquer. He doesn't return and then conquer death and then set the world right. No, the, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 very clearly that death is the final enemy uh, for Christ to defeat. So we believe uh, that, that many enemies, that the enemy of Marxism, the enemy of communism, the enemy of uh, the Clintons, the enemy of, you know, like all these different, will be defeated progressively at different stages as the church continues to grow in strength and influence and power. Um, and and then lastly, upon Christ's physical final return, he'll defeat death. Um, so, so the nations, Isaiah 65 gives us a description where Christ has not yet returned because death is still happening. It's not yet been defeated, but uh, the nations no longer know war. Um, and lifespans have been linked. Uh, uh, no one uh, any longer dies in infancy. That means abortion has been completely eradicated. Um, and also certain um, in infant diseases uh, have been eradicated. And the youth dies at 100. Where if, if somebody dies at 100 years old, uh, you would look at, at him and say, I'm so sorry uh, to his family for your loss. I can't believe he was just a kid. Yeah. Yeah. And all this before Christ's final return in our distant future, currently in a dip, but the overall trajectory mm -hmm. being moving forward. So and, primary and, water. <laughs> <laughs> but well, and, and so it, it is worth, I think, exploring whether that's possible, uh, theologically speaking, if we can actually have people die at 100 and it be considered very young. And the answer is yes. But a lot of objection that I hear is people say, well, in Genesis, God says their years will be limited to 120. And, and then after the flood, you see a, a, a steady degradation of lifespan yep. that eventually, you know, goes down to 120. By the way, after like 20 generations after the flood is yep. only is only that. So is Christ really that bad at, or is God really that bad at fulfilling his word? Right. No, what he's doing is he's prophesying the time of the flood. Right. Mm -hmm. It was 120 years. Until the flood. Until, until the, the flood. flood. And then the flood comes and it's really fascinating how after the flood, once the waters recede back into the earth, you have lifespans steadily decline. Yep. Mm -hmm. Coincidence? With no exception. I think not. So there, the water goes under the earth, this fresh new water, the great springs, that, and then people start living shorter and shorter. And lives. it's interesting how it, it also, let's just assume that this is right. Let's suspend any disbelief and say that primary water is legit. 100%. And that primary Full water sound. was one of the major mechanisms that God used to flood the world in Genesis. This, the symbolism itself is striking. How you have a, a mankind that hates its God and, and therefore hates itself uh, because the fool says in his heart, there is no God and the fool is the one that loves death. And so using the, the tool that was given to man to enliven them, right. God uses that same tool to kill mm. and end that wicked line in the same way that Christ took death and used death well, to kill death. In the same mm. way that baptism good, then, then is a sign both of judgment and of salvation right. right? in that we're saved through the waters of death that swallow Pharaoh's armies, that swallow the world. We're saved from the floods. Our Lord is seated high over the floods, Psalm 93. He rides on the waves, but we're saved through them. We're in the ark of Christ. The world is yeah. deluged so and the, drowned. The water represents death and judgment, but it also represents, it's not just that we're saved through them, but then the positive application is that same water that is judgment and death for some is the same water that is cleansing. Right. It also and flows out of the, for others. The Ezekiel, the temple in Ezekiel um, is figured as having water flowing out over its threshold into a great river that grows deeper as it 
goes out, goes forth. Ezekiel and, 47. And creates essentially an oasis in life. So these, yep. these pictures, biblical symbols are, are, are not simple or one dimensional. Yep. And often what you'll find is that the same taste that uh, to the saint is life is death to the unbeliever. Again, mm. Lewis picked this up in his apple that came from the tree in the garden in the magician's nephew that Jadis, the, the wicked queen from Charn took the fruit without permission and tasted it. And it would forever, the smell of it would keep her from Narnia for a hundred right. years. That's how Aslan protected Narnia. But for, um, for those who take it with permission, rightly, it's mm -hmm. life and it smells greater than any right. other fruit that got, so God's symbols in the world often look like this. Right. Diggory, his mom is brought back. She's brought mm -hmm. back from it. Yep. And, and, and at the end of the day, what we're saying with this primary water idea to actually define what it is, again, the idea that water is being created deep in the earth right. from magmatic processes and just not, that God made, it would create water. It comes up through tectonic fissures. The evidence for this manifold, we see uh, tectonic fissures are often filled with fresh water. Um, we find springs where they absolutely shouldn't be right. according to the local rainfall that continue for centuries even, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes millennia at a constant rate of fresh water coming out of the ground, regardless of what's happening in the atmosphere or the rains. We see springs coming out of mountaintops. When you would think that a spring would, if the basin above it was significant enough to capture that water, and then it could go under the ground into an aquifer and come out later, like an ar ar artesian well type of situation. Or mountain that springs sense. that are way above the water table of the local area. Yeah, we're seeing Anyways, right. them 4,000 meters above ground level where there's no, the water table's thousands of meters below. And we've got freshwater springs constantly flowing out of mountaintops. There's uh, evidence after evidence after evidence like this. And, and bringing it all together, what I would, if I had to do a little forecasting, say what might be, well, let's say that the leaven leavens the lump. And over the next, you know, let's just say that, you know, God said that he delights in the Old Testament to show his, his love and faithfulness to the thousandth generation of those who love him. 40 year generation, 40,000 years. Mm -hmm. That was about, I don't know, 4,000 years ago when that promise was spoken. So let's say 36,000 over the next 36,000 years, <laughs> God's faithfulness continues to be shown to his people. In the, the nations are converted and the, all of the ends of the earth, every family, as the Psalms say, you know, confesses the Lordship of Christ. They come to the mountain, Isaiah 2, to be instructed in God's law. And the, you know, we're starting to see some of these things. The means that God appoints are not always just purely um, deus ex machina, ghost in the machine, inter plot interventions, where all of a sudden God's like, and everyone's lifespan is now 100 years by magic. Right. He loves to use means right. and to raise his children to maturity to end up being the vehicle to those means. Mm. This is, the, again, the hobbit's journey from their immaturity to their full maturity the in the Lord hero. of the Rings, where they, they grow. It's the age of men, men coming into their fullness, it, going into the next age with the return of the king and the, the age of the elves ending. What if God was maturing his people? And as we search out the mysteries, we discover the means by which through his physical means, lifespans can be increased, not in an alchemical, we're going to talk about pharmacaea and mm -hmm. functional witchcraft, but in con, by actually going with the grain of creation right. as God made it, instead mm -hmm. of fighting against the grain of creation. Right. And who's to say, who's to say, given all of the imagery and metaphor and myth and legend and even scripture as well, of the life-giving properties of water, combined with this anti-humanist, anti-materialist theory, who's to say it doesn't have something to do with it? Right. Is that what we're saying? That's what we're saying. Is that what we're saying? That was beautiful. Boom. Beautifully said. So this episode recap, just to remind you guys, hollow earth theory. Confirmed. Uh, yep. <laughs> and, but, but hollow earth theory, maybe not exactly the way that Bird and some of the later components said it, you know, uh, journey to the center of the earth, but, but different spheres, porous, with support, shock kind of system, with massive caverns, not, not five miles down, but, but beneath the crust, 150, 200, 300, 400 miles down, uh, massive caverns with support, with water, with uh, vegetation, and with heat sources in different ways. And we didn't have time to conceptualize how that would happen without a sun, but heat sources and sources of light uh, sustaining uh, even wildlife and even massive creatures like dragons, 
like sea serpents. Um, and then and then beyond that, that gets us down there with the water, uh, water not being finite, but being made um, and new, w- w- healthier for you. And this uh, three, you know, very practical, and there's more that could be said, but three practical applications. One would be restoring places here, like Atlantis, which we didn't even have time to get oh, into. We didn't it, get into Atlantis. Located in the Sahara Desert, full sin. See, see episode one of season one of Haunted Cosmos. Yep. We'll talk about yep. the Rakat structure, Atlantis. The eye of the Sahara. Available. It's called High Strangeness on the High Seas. Yes. There you YouTube go. YouTube everywhere. So, it's, but it's Atlantis, a very solid argument to be made uh, that is actually located in the Sahara Desert and that mm. that could actually be restored. So Atlantis reaching uh, back to its zenith, but, but with good and not evil. That we yeah. could drill down and access primary water deep in the earth and bring it up and do another motif of scripture is that the deserts would become gardens, Right. that we would greenify the world and be able to see the Sahara garden and be able to see yeah, exactly. Utah become something other than a salt lick right. in LA. So beautifying yeah. the earth is one application and then the potential of there being primary water on other planets, Mars being yeah. one example and beautifying other places. Um, and then lastly, primary water and how it would affect just humanity. There's just, just, just a few applications. There's mm-hmm. far more, but how it could um, affect humanity and our health and elongating lifespans. That was our episode. Hope you liked it and tune in next time. Real quick, right here at the end, I just wanted to remind you to become a member at patreon.com forward slash right response ministries. Exclusively for our Patreon members, we have all 10 episodes, early access, ad free. Some of my favorite episodes to be looking forward to is episodes that deal with Bigfoot or fairies or ghosts or angels or giants, or particularly our episode on witches. If you want to watch these episodes now, and you want to watch them without any ads, then you've got to join us by becoming a member at patreon.com forward slash right response ministries.